to move on to our volunteer spotlight. Uh, I mentioned we're going to hear about the hackathon and some remote implementation from two of our volunteers, Pat Coyle and Phil Bowman from our San Francisco Professionals chapter. I tried to summarize their um, experience and titles onto the screen, but if you might have seen in the Zoom chat, um, they could go on for, for a while. These guys are, um, are some of our best uh, volunteers and are just leading the charge with, um, with their efforts. So Pat and Phil, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys to tell us uh, first a little bit about the hackathon. Okay, thank you. A very flattering introduction. <laughs> thank you for that, Vicki. Um, so over the weekend in July, uh, the 11th and 12th, we had our first hackathon, which was really exciting for us, and it was it gained a, got a lot of enthusiasm. Um, so what it was was we invited people to join either as individuals or as teams, and we gave them some general themes on what they we were looking for them to come up with some innovative ideas on. And it just turned out to be very successful. Of course, during the COVID times, the focus of this was how we can come up with some innovative ideas to respond to the COVID problems for a lot of the EWB communities around the world. We got a lot of participation. We had 51 hacker participants. Half of them were students and half professionals. Half of them were current EWB volunteers and half of them were new to EWB. So this was also a good opportunity to introduce some new people into what EWB is all about. And quite a diverse representation. We had at least nine or 10 countries represented from volunteers around the world. And of course, this was all done virtually, so it didn't really matter where they were, although some of the folks in Africa were having some time zone issues that we had to work through. But it was a, a really a terrific experience. This also brought together 28 mentors we had to help these teams either address their kind of technical questions, business questions. We wanted to put together some kind of a reasonable cost and implementation schedules for each of these projects and also some in-country mentors to ensure the teams were sensitive to cultural and, and challenges that some of these developing countries might experience and to whether their ideas would be applicable or not. And of course, we also had five judges from around the world as well. So an international panel of judges. Really exciting team of people that we all got together for this weekend. Uh, next slide. Let me give you some ideas of some of the clever ideas um, concepts that these teams came up with. Um, some of them were pretty simple, like a waterproof face mask for some countries that just get a lot of rainfall all the time to help preserve the effectiveness of these face masks. And there were some apps to help improve uh, access to PPE or access to food in areas where they've got food shortages or PPE shortages. We had a team looking at refugee camps and how we can bring water and sanitation to them. And a kind of a clever approach for a pure powered air purifier for healthcare workers. That's just some of these interesting examples. Of course, the one that got a lot of uh, talk among our mentors anyway was the idea of using locusts as a food source. So this was a group was putting this together to really address uh, some real problems that the Horn of Africa has. They've got uh, pests with uh, just a, a number of locusts are just devastating their crops. So they've got also have food shortages and drought and with the COVID all at one time, um, they're looking at collecting locusts and turning them into a food source. So it was an interesting idea. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep that on the, on, the, on the back burner as a possibility in the future, but it was not unfortunately selected as one of our winners. Next slide does show our three winners that the judges came up with. And we were looking at the projects for which would have the best impact on the communities, which would be technically feasible to implement by these communities, and which ones were kind of fit within a cost and schedule uh, time frame that was appropriate for um, the kind of projects that we were doing. And some of these solutions go from pretty low tech, like the first one was a, a low cost COVID barriers, basically taking a PVC pipe, strapping some tarps or even transparent shower curtains to them, these are for places where healthcare facilities have beds that are like right next to each other and not a clear, easy way to separate the um, kind of a barrier from the viruses spreading back and forth. So for eight bucks, we figured we can build these barriers. And uh, we actually have a partner with um, Engineering World Health with organizations and partnerships with hospitals around the world that is actually looking into seeing how they can implement some of these. And 
we're proposing doing a pilot program for one particular healthcare facility to build 30 of these in one place. Uh, another clever idea was to avoid transmission of uh, viruses by people uh, using these hand pumps was to convert it to a foot type of pump as well as making a hand washing station out of it. So we're looking at which communities might uh, we might best be able to implement this in. And the third one, which um, it was a, also quite interesting one, they have a kind of a combination of professionals and students working this. I think they like the idea of working with alcohol. <laughs> so they're looking at making hand sanitizer from distilled fruit beer. So a lot of our developing communities have fruit available and they do have um, local brewers turning that into beer. And with some extra distillation process, we can refine the alcohol content high enough to be used as a hand sanitizer. So we've um, kicked off a pilot project to work in Kabingo, Uganda. And the team has some connections with a chemistry teacher there who will be our kind of a field rep to help pilot this. So uh, they're moving ahead with that one. So it sounds really exciting a way of uh, really helping some of these communities with these innovative ideas. Uh, next slide. So this had such good feedback. The participants all had a ball. The mentors really enjoyed doing it. I think we uh, introduced a lot of new people to what EWB is all about and got them excited. Um, so we are looking at having some more of them and maybe we can expand the scope of these projects into some new technologies that come out of this. So some of the themes that we may be looking for in the future, and we haven't decided on these yet, um, you know, one of the things we've been talking about a lot today is how to do remote implementation of these projects. And my colleague Pat will be talking more about that in the next slide. But there could be some other tools and procedures that if we gave it a little brainstorming and had a hackathon on, we could come up with some clever ideas to improve the effectiveness of working remotely for some of these communities. Uh, we're also seeing some issues coming up with hurricanes and how this is going to be just uh, devastating in the time of COVID when we're trying to do separation and you have to kind of combine people together. So maybe there's some tools that we can come up with for disaster recovery. And also there's some, um, with COVID in particular, uh, schools around the world have been shut down or curtailed and uh, a lot of communities no longer have access to, to educational opportunities. So there may be ways that we can get some EWB uh, brain power to come up with some ideas to improve educational opportunities in these developing communities. So those are just a few of these ideas. Um, if you got some other ideas, we'd be glad to hear them. Um, and i um, looking forward to doing the next hackathon over the next several, sometime in the next several months. Thanks, Phil. Before we turn it over to Pat to talk about remote implementation, what I'll also share is that um, you know, as, as EWB considers moving forward with um, additional hackathons, I think this is such great feedback to hear, you know, what an amazing impact it was. But we are also trying to think of other ways to incorporate our corporate partners. So um, we will be coming up with um, some of those more, more engaging ways to really bring partners into these kind of events and um, see if there's a way for you guys to really engage um, with our volunteer board that way. So thanks again for that, Phil. And now we're going to switch over to Pat. Well, hello, everyone. I, I'm just delighted to be here. And uh, I just want to take a moment before I tear into this talk. And I'll point out one key thing. You'll notice this is the San Francisco Professionals and UC Berkeley project. It's a joint project. We're the, we're the chapter of record, but we consciously from the get-go launched with, with those students from the UC Berkeley team. And, and in terms of engagement and corporate partners, I think, uh, you know, I'd noticed in the participant list that, uh, uh, that Christopher Fallen was, was listed in the call there as his colleague said he was sitting in for him. But I remember a few years ago at one EWB conference, him speaking so eloquently about the importance uh, for any firms and construction firms uh, to tap into EWB volunteers and use it as a discriminating factor to, to find well-qualified candidates and then to support them in their EWB uh, trajectory and future career. So I think that's just great. And I, I, it resonates with me with engagement. Uh, you look at Phil and I, and we're retirees, but we, we just love it when we see these young uh, students picking up on EWB early on in their careers, as we have with our experience with the UC Berkeley chapter. Um, the other thing I wanted to call out in corporate sponsors, you know, we talked about uh, Stantec, and one of uh, last year's cohorts of students actually got us a grant from Stantec through the employee program. So 
thank you uh, for that. So with that, let's go to the next slide. So just in terms of this project in the central highlands of Nicaragua, El Lanito is a community of about 300 people, 300 homes, 1,100 people. And the water supply is primarily a 100 foot well with a hand pump. And some people walk a mile or more up and down hills to get their daily water. They've had the well since 2002, but have been waiting 20 years for a water distribution system. Next slide. And this is basically the situation. I mean, other people haul water too, but a lot of it falls on the back of uh, young women, girls. Uh, people spend an inordinate amount of time. Uh, you, you know, on the right there, you can see uh, women with five gallon pails of water on their heads. That's 40, that's 40 pounds of, uh, of weight on your head. And some of those people are walking, as I say, up to a mile. Next slide. So we, we were able to actually travel. We got a window uh, after having done an assessment trip in 2016, we were able to, and, and having the civil unrest in Nicaragua have a, 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 you know, a, a travel suspension for quite a long time. We, we were able to travel in, in, and were there in early uh, 2020 for the, uh, the first part of January. And we had two teams that overlapped by a couple days uh, to, to do what we called our early implementation, which was to get the, uh, the well support building, uh, which is uh, called the pump house here, uh, prepared and to start the pipeline. And the main thing we did is we, we got community members trained on the pipeline installation and cemented great relationships with all the partners and basically developed first articles of every item that was important to be built so that we we got most of those started and demonstrated before we left and then the implementation continued with remote implementation uh, uh, happening in our absence you know we we left in january and by early march we're all shut down in a global pandemic uh, but uh, during that interim, with care and with due caution, uh, the community finished four kilometers of pipeline, 50 tap stands, a couple pressure brake tanks, uh, some river crossings, initial electrical installation, and so forth. And we had a lead uh, foreman in uh, Nicaragua, they would call him uh, Mason, uh, and weekly visits from our Nicaragua country office engineer, Evelyn, was able to do that for us. And she was on site for all the critical work, like the electrical installation and the pump house. And, and Phil really carried the water for us. He, as our, our responsible engineer in chief, uh, dealt with weekly, sometimes daily communication via WhatsApp and Google Translate to resolve issues, approve material purchase, and so forth. Next slide. This will just, we'll go through these fairly quickly. They just highlight the work that continued after our absence. You can see on the left, uh, you can see all across these slides that we, we were anxious about how difficult it would be to trench in this terrain, but we were pleasantly surprised. Actually, by the time we left on January 18th, 90% of this pipeline trench had been excavated. But you can see in the far left, some of the installation areas were pretty rocky. Uh, and we'd had our doubts as to how difficult that would be. Next slide. Here are a number of those installations uh, from pressure brake tanks to a tap stand with its associated uh, meter in a valve box. Um, and so there'll be 50 of these throughout the community. So people are still gonna be hauling water, but they'll be hauling it much shorter distances than in the current scenario. Next slide. More tap stands. And uh, the multiple uh, uh, tubes in the, in, the, uh, in the one trench there were on their way up the hill towards uh, where our storage tanks located, but that's fine, we'll go on to the next slide. That was just a fairly busy chunk of trench. And so, you know, we're, we're basically almost done. We, we're approved for uh, the completion implementation, which we're projecting now through September. Um, we'll, we'll do that using remote implementation, continuing just as we have uh, since we left in January. And we'll coordinate with the country office to issue the pump installation contract and, and get the, the power connection from the utility uh, to the well support building install our storage tanks and chlorinator, test and commission the system and resolve problems. And 
we'll continue to use WhatsApp conference calls and, and video inspections of the work. Um, and the country engineering, country office engineer will be on site for critical work. As we hand off, what I would just like to emphasize were that in, as, as uh, Jackie mentioned in her remarks, the, the strategy of going to focus engineers without borders, ICP work in community, in countries with country offices has been extraordinarily beneficial for us. You know, the Nicaraguan country office is a very capable team and they're really a pleasure to work with. We've also tapped uh, Steve Crow uh, in the Guatemala country office for advice uh, on, for example, we're looking at ferro cement tanks and he, he was very helpful in that regard. Um, we we uh, were very fortunate to have uh, both the country office uh, capabilities as well as having a, an amazing level of commitment, engagement and capacity in our El Lanito community. Um, our NGO partners in Alcanza, Nicaragua are first class community facilitators. They live in and around the community and we've worked closely with them throughout the, the inception of this project. And I, I would stress, um, you know, we, we, we had to clip a few things out here, but we had five young women from Berkeley travel on these travel teams. And so for me, that's really heartwarming to see these young people coming, being exposed to what community development work is about. Uh, in the case of one of the cohort from last year, actually having a corporate relationship grant come to our project, just huge. So I really think that the opportunities for engagement uh, across the board with these corporate partners and, and the ability to bring young people into the organization, and in this very difficult time, you know, this is, um, my, my wife has joked, I'm a little COVID crazy here. It's, it's wonderful to see ways that even when sheltering in place, we can have an impact and make a difference with our partners. So thanks much for the opportunity to share this. Pat, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And I think you really hit uh, for me on, on something so important, which is that uh, even in this time, the work can continue on. Um, you guys are going to see this project through, through uh, all the way to fruition. And I think that's just so fantastic and says so much about the commitment of not only EWB, but of our volunteers to really push that forward.